So we're just going to start by introducing ourselves and then we'll get started. Um, I'm Mariette. I am the director of UAccess. I've been part of the campus community since 2015. I am Madeline Peña. I'm the accounts coordinator for the Office of Housing and Residential Life at um, the Res Halls here at UMass Boston, and I've been with the university since 2018. Wonderful. So we've been part of the community for a while, and we are excited to see the university have its first ever um, Black Lives Matter Day. And we're going to be able to talk today about um, healing and transformation. Um, pardon, just still allowing people in from the waiting room. All right. Okay, so the reason why we brought up this topic for this seminar is because there's so many things that has happened in the past couple months. Um, like there's the pandemic in addition to what's been happening with Black Lives Matter. Um, as two women of color, we thought that this was going to be important to speak through because of the pain that we felt in our family, in our community during this pandemic. Um, I'll share a little bit about my reactions and then we'll have Maddie share about her reactions. Um, just want to let everybody know, please make sure you're signing in for the event um, if you don't get a chance to. Um, and we'll also be able to put in a link later of how you could sign in. Um, so when, when the incident happened with George Floyd, when he was murdered by the police, this was a time where we were all going through a major transformation in society, seeing things that we've never seen before and experiencing a lot of pain. Um, for people of color, we were we experienced it first before, before society um, began to notice through protests and so many people bringing it through awareness by celebrities and politicians. Um, that was very painful for me because we've seen so much happen and it happened every single year to so many people of color. And I thought, how can I continue to uplift my community? How can I continue to emerge and resurface every time I feel drowned from all of this pain. Exactly, and it's not only that, is a lot of people of color share the same feeling of you're tired. You wake up every single day tired, waking up with feeling the same feelings every single day. It's like deja vu, Groundhog Day every single day when you hear on the news of another person of color being murdered by um due to police brutality or it's just be not only um a, a black man in this country um black women as well waking up not knowing if you are going to come back to your family um, if you're going to see your loved ones, not only is it tiring, but it really, it's painful and it really hurts that you have to live through that every single day. And nobody should have to experience that. No one should have to experience. No one should have to wake up thinking, is today going to be the day? Is today going to be my day that I'm not going to come back to my family. I'm not going to come back to see my loved ones or my kids. So on top of that, dealing with that every single day on a daily basis as a person of color, to throw in a pandemic as well, it all just, it's, it's so much to process and so many emotions to try to deal with that it's just very hard to, I apologize. 
Yeah, it's, it's very painful. It's it very is. painful to deal with, to think about how it impacts us and our family. When I think about, when we see things in the news, it's not just saying, okay, another person of color passed away today. But you always think, I have seven brothers. I have a father. Um, I have family. And you always think if they didn't care about them, what do they think about our brown and black family? So, but that's why we wanted our session today to focus on this healing and transformation. How are we taking care of ourselves? And how are we taking care of our community? So we want you all to know that this is going to be a interactive session um, as much as we can. Um, so we're going to be throwing some questions at the audience and um, I'm hoping that one or two people will be able to answer um, as we open this dialogue up to um, our campus community. So one of the main questions myself and Maddie had is what do we do when the protest is over? So many of you all have um, attended protests this summer in person, online, or you've even been able to protest in different ways in terms of how you're giving your money or decisions that you make or the businesses that you're supporting during this time. So our question is, you know, when the protest is over and you put the signs down and you go home, what do you do? So we also want to make it clear, we understand that it's okay to feel, to understand that you don't necessarily have to be out and about in an actual physical protest. There's other ways that you can protest. You can help protest by supporting your local black businesses, supporting, you know, black local artists. Um, there's many other ways of protesting without having to be in the actual physical protest because we do understand that protesting can trigger PTSD and we do understand that they have um, physical disabilities that can't attend a protest. And it's just, we understand that some people just do not do well in protesting. And when you do protest, it's a lot to take in because you do not know what you are gonna, what you are gonna face when you attend a protest. So do not feel less than because you do not attend a physical protest. It is okay. There's many other ways that you can be active. It just, it, the work does not stop at just protesting. So we want to make sure you understand that it's okay. We have a couple of people who answered. One said, educate your family, friends, and anyone who listen. And we also have Isabel who wanted to make a comment. So what do you do when the protest is over? Um, I was going to say, um, when a protest is over, you should continue educating yourself um, because um, the advocacy does not end after a protest. You should continue standing up, advocating. Um, you don't just go silent after a protest. Exactly. The work doesn't end after a protest. Just because you attended a protest, that's it. You don't put down your signs and let them collect us. You are correct. Continue to fight, um, advocate, with whether it's through social media, whether it's like um, Sarah Ho Horsley. Um, she mentioned, raise my son to be anti-racist. That's so important. Um, I agree with you, Sarah. I am a mother. I have a seven-year-old. And I've, I've said it since day one. Nobody, no one is born hating or a racist. That is taught. And as a parent, myself, I am doing all that I can to teach my son that you always fight for what is right and you treat people equally. And by all means, that is fighting for your family, friends, people of color. And perfect example, his best friend is black. And this has been so hard on him, a seven-year-old. My son should not have to experience this. This is very hard on me as a parent to see my son having to go through, go through this and experience this, asking me throughout when George Floyd got murdered, asking me, mom, 
is Brian next? Is my best friend next? Are they going to kill Brian and his mom? My son shouldn't have to be asking me that. And this is why we all love Maddie. This is why we're doing our session on how do we heal and transform? How do we advance? What, what is the next thing? Um, oftentimes people are in protests and you even hear people step up with the mic and they're just saying, I've been to countless protests. I protested last year. I'm protesting this year and most likely. I'm going to have to think about it next year. So how are we taking care of ourselves? And let's talk about some of the things that we need healing from. Now, we have some up on the slide, but we're totally open to our community and friends um, putting stuff in the chat and letting us know what else you need healing from. So some of them that we thought of was media, right? So for example, in media, as a woman of color, if I see another woman of color in a protest get slammed down to the sidewalk um, as they're arrested from a protest, it triggers me. So I need healing from media, um, from systemic racism. I, we see it happening in society, but then I go to work and I face it at work as well. So I need healing from that. You wanna take the next two? Exactly, past experiences. As a person of color, you, I can guarantee Every person of color can think of a past experience, a past, whether it's a past experience or a recent, or even they face on a daily basis, some form of racism that they have encountered or encounter on a daily basis. So we have to learn to heal from that. Um, reactions, it's, it, it, how is your community it, reacting to exactly. it, right? So you could be someone who's like a really close to you or a colleague at work that you usually have a split a donut with and then all of a sudden they they don't share the same thoughts as you. And then you, you feel like, wow, this is people I considered my community. These are people that I respected. It could be even reactions from um, celebrities that you admired, designers that you admired. Um, when they come out and they make these statements and you're just thinking like, wow, that's really painful. Exactly. Um, especially when it's, when it's uh, a reaction from someone that you thought you really, you really, especially, respected. exactly, that is somebody that you really respected and you looked up to, to for them to have a, react, a reaction completely different to what you thought they were going to react. Um, that's very tough. And you, you have to learn to heal from that and learn how to take that as it is. Mm -hmm. We also have complacency. Sometimes you're looking at these large organizations. Um, sometimes they could be leaders within your own community, within um, our own government, our campus. And sometimes their actions could come off as just being complacent and silent and not saying anything. And sometimes people have to take a step back because they're in pain too. But other times you're just like, how can you just let this happen? Um, it's as if say someone walked in and they punched Maddie in front of me. I did nothing. <laughs> She's like, I thought you cared about me. So sometimes it's um, complacency, trauma, built up past experience. Yes, definitely trauma. Um, trauma, I believe is a big one because for example, I have had people in my family that have had ex, um, experienced situations where, um, racial situation, situations where they have been brutally beaten by police, um, you know, white people, situations where that can really damage you and it, it almost wants to, it leaves you in a place where it, it wants to, it leaves you angered and it builds like this fire in you and you want to just like hate the person and creates hate and fuel hate within you. But you have to remind yourself that hate is not going to, hate is not going to do anything. You have to rise above that. Um, to not to make sure that you don't let the hate consume you um, and mask the, 
mask your trauma. Correct. We even sometimes need healing from our own government or as we're going to transition to the next slide, just this cycle. So sometimes we need a healing because we find ourselves like we're in a hamster wheel. The same thing happening to us over and over and over again. So right here, this is just one example of the cycles we're talking about. So um, for example, my family, we grew up living in poverty. So the child grows up living in poverty, then their disadvantage and their education and their skill set, they struggle to find a job, and then they fail to escape the poverty cycle, and then that enters into the next generation. So we have a question for you all. We need a brave soul. How do we escape our realities, or how do we make effective change for the next generation? So. Sometimes it can't even just be the job you have or the education you have because sometimes people don't recognize the different skill set that you bring in. Exactly. And you're still stuck in that same poverty cycle because people want to continue to push you down. Um, but sometimes it works for others. It's sad though because we do have, for example, my beautiful friend here next to me who has her PhD and I see all her hard work that she has put day in and day out. And sometimes I feel she does not get the recognition that she deserves. So it's sometimes not even you're having come from poverty and having your education as a person of color. It's like, it's not enough. So what is enough for a person of color? What else does, does a person of color have to do? What else do we have to prove? What, what do we need to do? You know what I'm saying? So. They tell you sometimes it's how you dress, who you're around, the, the, um, your education. But then oftentimes you're still posed as some type of threat. Um, and nothing you can do can make you seem less threatening or more important than the next person. Um, there are so many examples, like for example, over the summer when the gentleman was in the park and he was bird watching and um, he could be considered a acad academic elitist and yet the cops were still called on him. So how do we escape these realities? I think somebody has a question. Right here, the same, um, it says ST Monic. Um, the same things keep happening because we're not starting at the root and we're not educating. We're not educating our children. We're allowing them to learn the lies and feed from that within the school system. They're not getting the whole truth, the horror, the heart that people of color have gone, gone through for centuries. I agree. I believe, I personally believe, that's why, me as a parent, I do my due diligence. I, um, try to teach my son um, the, tr the, the real truth. I mean, obviously he's still seven, but I believe that the school system, the universities, everybody needs to do a better, a better job at teaching the truth because what is being taught right now is not the truth. And that's why we need transformation because change is needed. History is repeating itself. There's a lack of advancement for brown and black people. There's so much pain and trauma, like what we were talking about in the last slide, why we need so much healing. Um, it, it's tough. Even even the, me and Maddie have been presenting this presentation for three weeks and you know it's still hard to suppress some of these feelings even while presenting. Um, we need transformation because there's so much inequality in the United States, even from the last session. We saw that there's so much inequality within our own campus. And it's sad, but it's the reality. And that is something that it definitely needs to change. And I know it seems like it's tiring because I know people like my grandmother has been fighting this. You know, people can say my grandmother has been fighting this. You know, I'm still fighting my grandmother's battles or, you know, and nothing is changing or nothing is really changed. We don't see any change. People are still living in fear. No one should have to live in fear. Everyone is equal. Just because our color of skin 
is different, that doesn't mean that we should be treated any different. We are not less than. Absolutely. So then some people will ask, why are we still fighting? I just want to note that um, Isabel made a comment that we need to recognize the biases. It's the biggest part of effective change. The more we recognize from reading and having real conversation, the more we will, the more change will come. And then teaching the younger generation about anti-racism. That is very true. Um, it is a very hard conversation. It's, there's no doubt about it. It's tough conversation, but it needs to happen. It needs to happen. These tough conversations need to happen. They need to happen all across the university, all across the United States. These hard conversations need to happen because without them, we're never going to get anywhere. So then the next question is, then why are we still fighting? Um, we'll ask this audience the same question. Um, I still fight because I have family. I still fight for my brothers and sisters, for my parents. I do too. I still fight for my family, my, my sisters, my cousins, and my number one reason, my son. My son, because I don't want my son to grow up in a world, this world that we're currently living in. No child should, be, should grow up in this, current, in this world that we currently live in. Nobody should wake up every day worrying about if they're going to be brutalized, if they're going to be, um, if they're going to be killed today, if they're going to make it back to their family. Everybody needs to be treated equal. We're all human. And I know I still fight for my students. Exactly. I see my students and they're here, they're getting an education, especially at UMass Boston, to make a change for their fa family, friends, and loved ones. And just because I have difficulty doesn't mean that I want to see my students have difficulty. I want to be able to see them use their education and make change. We have um, Earl Williams who would like to make a comment. Earl? Oh, I'm here. I just had to find the mute button. How are you? Um, so I'm 47 years old. And for me, I think that a lot of the issues that we have in our own community is that we don't work well together. And I feel like if we work within ourselves to better us, because I think sometimes the reason that systematic racism happens is because they know how to get us to fight amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. And nothing happens with that. So I think if we work in our own neighborhoods and we, I live in a predominantly white neighborhood, so I'm the only, guy on, only black guy on my street. But I also have neighbors that have come to me and we've had conversations that it didn't get you know, escalating into some big fight. And, but in our own communities, I see that we, I grew up in the projects in Florida, in Miami. We fight too much amongst ourselves and nothing really happens. And that's what I think they count on. I think if we get better at not doing that, then I think we can move further. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Earl. I think it's very true. Um, I feel the same. We're in a society where uh, people of color always have to be the first or the only, only black person in their classroom, only black person in their street. And if we have this um, stigma that when it comes to people of color, black people, Hispanic as well, um, we're the loud ones, the troublemakers. Um, touching to your point that we're always, you know, the violence amongst each other. Um, I agree with you, we need to work on that amongst ourselves, but I feel personally that a lot of that also stems from the pain that we all have deep within each other, um, within ourselves, from everything, you know, all of this, from the racism, the inequality, um, people are tired. People are tired, they're tired of being treated, um, you know, less than. Yes, less than. They're, they're tired of walking 
into into a store and just because you are a person of color being frowned upon or looked as if oh because they think you can't afford a, buying a piece of clothing or something we yeah. also have um ann ann malone who shared a comment as to why she fights she fights with fierce love because racism harms and kills um bio, uh, biopic communities I fight with fierce love to dismantle racism because it harms all of us, including white people. I think Monica probably agreed, or maybe that was a heart. And um, we have Christina who mentioned, we still fight because the system has not yet recognized as people, human beings, let alone our struggle. Even after they do, we should continue to fight because once we stop, they go right back. And Monica commented, if our ancestors fought no matter what, because they need a change. We fight today because we still need change. Thank you so much. Those even made me feel better. Exactly. Even having this conversation um, um, helps people. So we have Anthony Ume who has a comment. You could just unmute um, your mic and um, let us. So one thing, one thing that I, I want to contribute to the conversation is based on, basically I feel as if that um, in order to move forward, we also have to take into consideration on history and be able to kind of, it's hard to digest, but we need to also understand that. Um, within education, we learn the basics, Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass, um, Rosa Parks, just like the basics, but however, I feel as if that we need to embrace more um, of the African-American culture and knowledge to be able to kind of get more in depth with certain things. And then another thing I wanna say is mental health is a significant proportion of the development when it comes to moving to the next stage. African Americans in the minority community, we are kind of embraced and we're kind of taught that um, whatever happens in the home stays in the home, which is fine to a certain extent. But when it comes, with it, like you said earlier, traumatic um, experiences, in order to kind of overcome the traumatic experiences, we need to talk, we need to have these discussions. So if we don't do those things, then we're, we're only setting ourselves back, you know? So that's just you are 100% right, Anthony. Um, I am Hispanic. I mean, I'm Latina. Um, in the Latino community, you are taught mental health is like, no, you know, you keep things to yourself. Everything's okay. You have to like put up this wall. And same thing in the Black community. Mental health is real. And mental health in our communities, it's huge. A lot of a lot of our people suffer from mental health and it is something that we really need to look into and we need to address. And it is okay, you need to speak up. It is very important to um, whatever you are feeling, your feelings are valid and you need to seek help. Um, because we have, we're gonna definitely get into yes, that. We're gonna, we uh, thank you so much, Anthony. We have um, three comments that I wanted to mention and then we're gonna um, get to the next part. But um, Perry mentioned she agreed with the comment and she shared her experience as a Jewish woman and um, that there's a teaching in uh, Judaism, Judaism that, that motivates her. And she said it is the following. We are not obligated to complete the work of repairing the world, but neither are we free to desist from it. So it's just being part of that change that's important. Aurora mentioned, um, asked the question, how do you explain to someone that their pain and loss is not a competition for who has the worst biopic life experiences. Um, thank you for that. And then Anne shared um, a couple books such as Anti-Racist Baby and How to Be Anti-Racist in the comments for people who are interested um, in reading more into it and Iman um, agreed. Go back to um, this one real quick. To Aurora, just really quick. Um, going back to your question, you shouldn't have to explain to nobody your pain um, and your loss. It is no competition. Everyone's loss and pain on a loved one, family, friend, whatever the case regarding whether it's police brutality or whatever the case may be, no one's loss outshines, for example, if Mariette loses somebody due to police brutality, and I do as well, her loss does not outshine my loss. And nothing is bigger than the other. We exactly. still feel the pain. That's exactly. All of our pain is just as the same 
And that's why we all need to come together to fight for equality and for a better future because no one is better than. And that's why we, in this following slide, we're showing examples of how this is an international issue. This is not just in our community. It's way bigger than us. Um, and we see a lack of action from government and social, social institutions all over the world. Um, so in 2019, um, police in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil killed 1,810 people, an average of five people per day. In 2019 as well, in Kenya, the Kenyan police killed 122 people between October 2019 and January 2020. Three months. Exactly. Um, in between October 2019 and January 2020, um, police in Iraq killed around 600 protesters. Between 2015 and 2018, over 500 people were fatally shot by the police in Jamaica and over 300 shot and injured. Around 1,000 people are killed by the police, um, by police in the United States every year. That's three people a day. So many of these stories of people are not heard of and spoken about. And then there's even data that shows um, the disparities as well and the issues that we're going through. For example, in the chart to the left, it shows um, small town issues. So while large cities account for 30% of fatal police shootings, the rate of police shootings per 100 homicide is much higher in smaller communities, but little research has been done to show it. And then on the, if you look at the slide on the right, it says answering the call. Researchers looked at at responses to 1.2 million 911 emergency calls in the United States, in, in U.S. cities, and plotted the U.S. Um, the U.S. of force involving a gun across neighborhoods, according to their racial com composition, white officers were more likely to use a gun than were black officers, and more likely to do so in predominantly black neighborhoods. And if you look at the chart, the orange line that those are the white officers and the blue is the black officers and you will see the jump from zero to 100. Which is for me this is very painful to think. I know that um, just growing up in my neighborhood the amount of times that police officers were called on my family and the amount of times they were called on my brothers and I've seen police come into my house and um, attack my family and when I say attack my family my brothers were just 13 and 14 when they would come and arrest them and um, slam them on the ground but at the same time when something happened to my own brother and he was shot the police didn't even come and he had to walk to the police station himself after being shot in the head and fainted on the steps of the police steps. So that just goes to show how sometimes people will have this pain in their hearts and they'll go through so much, but then they need healing from it. They need to have something to take away or else they'll, they won't be able to function. And not and just to touch on fairly quickly, um, Walter Wallace Jr., who his mother called the cops because he was obviously facing a, him. He was having a, mel, a mental mental breakdown, let's say. Like he was having a mental breakdown. They called for assistance and he was fatally shot in Philadelphia. Just last week. So that goes to show you right there. like. You can't step through. Exactly. So we're thinking, is anything changing? And I think they started to touch a little bit about this in the last um, seminar. But me and Maddie was looking at um, how we're comparing the Black Lives Matter protests to the civil rights protests and um, how both of these movements um, 
compared to each other. Yeah, and like we know that there's no doubt that the countless protests that happened during the civil rights movement led to change and there has been some change. Um, but it is still very evident that there are two still big major pressing issues that are prevalent and are still current during the Black Lives Matter movement this day. And that's the police brutality and we're still fighting for equality. Those are still huge issues. Um, so has anything really changed? Um, no, and the system. Exactly. But the people are changing. Yes. In people, different ways. Exactly, yes. So people are changing in terms of, um, sometimes we, we win people over they start to understand they come from a generation that wouldn't be with us in the civil rights era, but then the next generation, their, their children are supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. So people are changing, yes, but we see that there's a lot of issues still within the system. So we have this comparison right here um, between 1963 and 2020. Um, and it just makes me think of, um, the song when they say that's the way and um, the rapper speaking about how he sees no changes. Um, people are still, still fighting. Awesome. Yes, people are still fighting. And even when you're looking at how protesters are. When the protests happen um, and you see the protests happened throughout our nation and you see the different cities. It's sad, but when you look at these two images, this is what you see. No matter how peaceful the protests are, a lot of the times, this is the outcome. Any reactions that anybody want to add before we move on? Um, it's kind of disappointing seeing these two images from the civil rights movement and now, and just that nothing's really changed. There's been some change, but there's very minimal. Agreed. And so that's why when we, the previous slide, when we said, has there really been any change, we put, sadly, there hasn't really been, I, we put the answer is no, because although there has been some change, there really hasn't in the sense that we, when you look at the pictures, the pictures are still shockingly, sadly, very similar. And that's very, very scary. And it's, it's sad because by now, these pictures should be, there should be a difference in between these pictures. There should be some form, there should be some difference in these pictures, but sadly there isn't. And um, Anthony Ume wanted to share a comment with us. Um, so what I want to say to contribute to this uh, picture is basically, um, from what I can say, it takes two people to have a conversation. So as much as Earl uh, earlier was discussing that as African Americans, as a minority community, we need to come together, have these conversations and develop a, you know what I mean, a better outcome of what we can do to for the next stage. It's, it's the same thing with the government on the, uh, on the opposite side. So we need them to able to accept change and are they willing to move forward in a better way. So it takes two people to really make this thing work. And when I, I'm taking criminal justice right now, what I'm seeing is that the government is has a systematic way of of their teaching so people that are in these um these academies are learning bad behavior bad policing so they do not they don't know how to cope and they don't know how to regulate african americans and what they're basically teaching um police officers is that african americans are just crazy people so they don't know exactly how to communicate with us or um or make that change um and then another thing too is that even within these um academies um they are really still pushing more ignorance than any good so it's just like 
I feel like with with them is they have this they have techniques with it when it comes to like community policing. So they may you may see some police like come into the communities, you know, donate, come to basketball games, do ice cream, this and that, this and that. But that is not changing the the, the main fact of the realities of African Americans. Um, exactly, um, and I agree. They have this misconception of people of color. They automatically think that blacks, Latinos, Asians, everybody. You're a person of color, they think, oh, this person's a thug or, you know, drug dealer, you know, drug yeah. addict. All you, you, you all know misconceptions, you, you name it, they think of us. They don't automatically think, they see a person of color, they automatically think, oh, thug, lock your doors, you know, things like that. And it have, I'm not, I'm not saying it's just white people because it does happen within our own communities. Mm -hmm. Racism is very thriving, alive and well in the Latino community, the black community, but they ought to, instead of, they don't, they automatically think thugs. They don't see, oh, doctor, PhD candidate. Like they don't see those, they don't think that. They'll automatically think thug or, you know, they think bad instead of, Good. We even have someone in the comment section, Deanna, who mentioned the myth that people of colors can dress, speak, act, or present themselves in a certain way as to not be threatening to white people or the police is not only untrue, but normalizes and perpetuates white violence and ignorance. Just thinking sometimes when I buy my nephew something and I'm like, oh no, I don't want to buy him a hoodie. So scared to say, I don't want to buy him a hoodie. I want to buy him a collarless shirt so people don't find him intimidating is scary. He's exactly. 11 months and I'm already thinking that. And that's, that's very terrifying. Exactly. Um, but we're going to get to a more positive side. <laughs> and the, all of this is just to say, like, when we say Black Lives Matter, we want people of color to understand and internalize this idea that their life matters, that my life matters, that Maddie's life matters. And this is why we, once again, we wanted to talk about the pain and the trauma that our community is facing, but then we also wanted to switch over and talk about how we could protect our minds, hearts, and lives. Exactly, because not only is it extremely important to fight for what's right, you also have to protect your mind, heart, and your life. Like you have to take care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself, no one will do it for you. And therefore, if you don't take care of yourself, how are you gonna fight for what's right? And how are we gonna fight for change? So we, in the presentation, we included um, different ways that you can include in your everyday routine to help you um, day in and day out to help you take care of yourself and take care of your mind, your body, um, to help you heal from, when it comes to healing from trauma. Um, and if you look at the picture, so if you're experiencing, if you experience or are experiencing trauma, you may need to um, get more sleep, um, get more sleep than normal. Therapy, therapy helps a lot. Talk to someone. Do not hold it in. That only causes more damage. Find a friend. If you don't have a friend, a family member, if you can't speak to a family member, um, there's counselors on campus, numbers, um, colleagues, find someone. There's definitely, please do not hold it in because you're only gonna cause yourself more damage than, and you're gonna do, cause yourself more harm than good. Um, Try to establish a routine that values gentle movement. Um, take breaks during argument that, for example, if you are discussing the situation, the topic with a colleague or someone, and it's getting very intense and you're getting emotional, take a break. It's okay to step away. Um, and... I think that one thing is when you look at um, routines that value gentle movement, it could be even working out or taking a walk. And sometimes you just have to take space 
not only or take a break, you might even have to take space from people who you feel like are draining, draining or, you or making you feel emotionally. Unwell. And not just people, social media, the news, all of that, because all of that is very draining and can and will consume you. So that's very important that you establish uh, a line between try to establish a line a perimeter between social media the news all of that and take time for yourself because that will consume you one campus uh, resource we're going to talk about a couple campus resources and then we're going to go into um, back we're just we couldn't talk about this without mentioning that if you all need support now we do have UHS counseling um, and we have the information with their phone number. It's up on our website, um, so you could find it there. But even through the pandemic, while campus is closed, there is emergency phone support. Um, so we wanted to mention that. And then there's also another campus resource called UMB Your Best. Um, and it has different resources, even for, um, also for students of color. But um, some of the things that they mention on their website for students of color is um, to have a, a surviving and resisting hate toolkit, finding and um, finding a provider that fits your cultural background. Um, I know that's very important to certain people. Um, finding someone that they feel will understand um, their background and they can probably relate to um, impact on racism, as well as you know mental health uh, fact sheet. UMass Boston and Beyond Mental Health Resource Guide, Ways to Self, um, to self Advocate for Mental Health Services. And so you can email them or you could go on the website and there's a plethora of resources that is available. I encourage you all. And if, um, as we're going through the different ways um, for you to advance and heal, um, if you guys have comments, feel free to enter that in the comment section. Um, so one of the resources that they have is the Surviving and Resisting Hate Toolkit, and that's by Dr. Hector and Dr. Nayeli. Um, and we're just going to go through it now. So one of the first pieces um, is that as, as people of color and allies, as you're going through this fight, you have to remember that your body matters. Yes, it's very important that you take care of your body. Um, your body is your sanctuary, your body is your temple. Um, you, it's very good to try and st um, stay physical, um, not only physical, but psychologically healthy. Um, try to eat healthy, sleep, at least try to get seven to eight hours of sleep a night. I know that's very hard um, for a lot of people, especially if you're under stress. Um, your mental health plays a lot, has a lot to do with that as well. Um, but try to find ways to cope with your stress, whether it's through finding a hobby, working out. For me personally, I find that my way to release stress is working out. Um, some people find reading, um, knitting, find something that will help you release and disconnect from everything that's going on to try to bring you back to a calm place. Um, disconnect from social media and staying physically active, going for a walk, a hike, or so forth. And um, if you're someone who can't be physically active, it's still important to um, look at the healthy eating and sleeping, taking breaks from social media. So you also have to recognize that your community matters. So staying connected to individuals and organizations that help. Just today, we have so many people who are on this call and you could just see the names of faculty, students and staff who are part of your community, who cares about you, who supports you and wants to be there for you. Yes, sometimes it comes down to the basics and sometimes it's something that we always know in the back of our head, but sometimes we don't know that we have the, these allies and people who are willing to support us until um, something like this happens. So fall back on your community. Yes, um, very important. People are here. Um, use 
use the resources, use the um, health services resources. The UMB, um, okay. UMB your best. UMB your best. Use all the resources available. Um, I'm an accounts coordinator, but I am more my my door is welcome. Email me. I, we're all here to help. Do not think that you, we don't want you to think that just because we're faculty, staff, um, that you can't, you can't approach us. We are here for you, okay? And if you ever feel alone, you don't have no one to talk to, you don't have friends, there's always somebody here for you. There's you will find someone. Sometimes it's a matter of making that one connection on campus. I'm the director of U Access, but sometimes people don't know who I am, especially since I started last month. Um, but people, one person could know a hundred. Exactly. And that hundred could know a thousand. If I can't help you, I will definitely do my best to guide you in the right direction, to send you to that person that will help you, just as Mariette will. And I know everyone on campus will. So please ask for help, reach out, do not feel alone because you are not. The third is your intuition. We want you to know that your intuition matters. Sometimes people, could, people of color or allies could feel so oppressed that they start to think maybe something's wrong with me, maybe I was wrong, Maybe I went a little too hard, or sometimes you're rethinking a conversation that you just had with a colleague or a classmate, and you're thinking, oh, maybe I was wrong. No, your intuition is correct. If you felt like you just felt a microaggression from a coworker or from um, another student, your feelings are very valid. So remember that that matters as well. Listen to your gut and remember um, that you can have a healthy level of cultural suspicion. Exactly. And to touch on what Mariette said, your feelings are valid. What you feel is valid. Um, everyone has the right to that. Everyone has the right to their own opinions and their feelings. So just because Mariette feels a certain way and I feel a certain way, the way she feels doesn't make my feelings less than. Your goals, mm -hmm. very important. Focus on your goals, finish your projects, and do your best. It's like I tell my son, even if you're unsure, you always want to make sure you give your 100%. And your best and always give your best at everything that you do in life, even if you get it wrong. Because at the end of the day, you can always say, I did my best, I tried my best, and that that is all you can do and you you always know it's like i always say no wrong answer the, no answer is a wrong answer um you always want to um make sure and know that being successful is whatever you do and that is in and of itself um, there's a quote that I heard in the Haitian community and to, to dryly translate it into English, um, it just goes, do the best you can, however you can, wherever you can, in any way you can until you can't know more. And that was me trying to translate it super fast. But it's a matter of sometimes taking care of yourself is realigning yourself with your goals and the things that you're trying to accomplish. You're trying to accomplish them for a reason. The things that you're trying to do all within your gut and they all have meaning um and you have to be able to realign yourself and sometimes that's how you take care of yourself sometimes i would think okay i'm feeling blue what's going on how's work how's school how's family so sometimes you can't control society but you could try to try your very best in order to hold on to what you can't control exactly um, you can't control society or what society thinks of you or about you you can always control yourself and your feelings and you always want to make sure you stay true to yourself and to your to your feelings and for what you you feel was right in connection to that your family your family is very important and your family matters um 
focus on change for the people closest to you. So sometimes um, that could be supporting your family, or that also could be influencing your family, especially now with elections tomorrow. Not everybody has the same perspectives, even within family. Thanksgiving is going to be very interesting this year. And we also understand that family dynamic nowadays isn't a mother and father. Sometimes family is a friend or even, you know, a neighbor. Um, fam, you just want to, it's important to know that whoever, whatever your family consists of, whether it's a mother, father, sibling, friend, neighbor, or a person down the street, know the importance of and the value of what that person brings to you and into your life. Exactly, because that's the person right immediately next to you and you could possibly have influence on them. But like it says right here, by focusing on the big macro picture, it could make you feel paralyzed. It could make you wake up. It could make you shut your laptop at the end of the day and just think, why bother? And we want you to understand your healing matters. You can feel however you want to feel. As we mentioned earlier, your feelings are very valid. Exactly. And it is important. We can't stress enough. This, as we were creating this presentation, that was a huge point that we want to stress to you all. Your feelings are valid. It is whatever you're feeling, however you're feeling, it is okay. And you have every right to feel that way. And it is okay to express that. Do not feel like you have to hold yourself back because you're in front of whoever. No, your feelings are valid and you have every single right to express your feelings. One part of this slide even that I want to turn your attention to is this. Anger could even lead to positive change. You know, you're, you're, you're worried, you're angry about something and it fuels you to make a change. Your intentions. So I think that this part is very big. Um, one thing that they continue to mention in our communities is this concept of intent versus reality. So it says right here, listen and validate the experiences of people of color with different backgrounds of your own. So I am a black woman with a Haitian background, but Maddie, that doesn't mean that Maddie goes through the same thing. Exactly. She's a Latina. I am a Latina with, my parents are from the Dominican Republic, but it's like I, I've spoken to Mariette about, I am lighter than her. Yes, I am, I am still a person of color, but if right now we are in a situation, there's times where I am gonna experience privilege, even though I am a person of color because of the color, the color difference of our skin. Even at the Museum of Fine Arts last year, I was kicked out. I was being threatened to be kicked out, literally because of the color of my skin, and I had to go report it to the Museum of Fine Arts. And it was literally because the guard said that I had an attitude. This is, this is things that happened, but at the same time, I was with four other people of color, but they were lighter than me. And they were told, you guys can stay, she can't. And this was all just because I was trying to help out the guard by telling people, don't touch that, you shouldn't touch that, we're in a museum. But it happens all the time. People have, pe four people of color could walk in to the same place and all be treated differently. Um, your pain, your pain is very important. The burden of oppression and injustice is too heavy to carry on your own. Do what it takes to keep yourself going while remaining committed to racial and social justice. That is extremely important for the simple fact that this is such a strong, hard, painful topic because going back, People of color wake up every single day worrying about, am I gonna make it back home? Like, 
just let that sink in. Having to wake up every single day thinking, is today going to be the day? Am I going to make it back to my family? That's extremely painful. Like, who can live in fear like that? I don't want that for my son. I don't want my son to go have, have, I don't want that for my son. I don't want that for my nephew. I don't want that for my, ne my, my nephews. I don't want that for any child in this world. I don't want that for my brothers and sisters of color. I don't want that for my people. I don't want that for anybody. Right? Your resiliency matters. Focus one breath at a time. Sometimes people admire the resiliency of people of color without realizing that that is a direct insult because it's supposed, it, it could indicate that they're able to take on more pain, that they're able to take on more pressure. They fail to realize that nobody of color, black people did not choose to, they don't choose to, People, choose, people are strong because they have no choice. People wake up every morning. They don't, people are tired. I don't want to be strong today. I want to be a regular, normal person. A black person just shouldn't have to wake up every single day. Okay, I have to be strong. They're tired. Okay, people are tired. They're strong because they have no other choice. People have no other choice. And when you have no other choice, you have to do what you have to do. Because if they're not strong, who's gonna be strong for them? Tell me. So it's not a compliment to tell a person of color that they're resilient. It's very painful, because then it's expected that they stay that way. So while your resi resiliency is important, protect that too, and put that resiliency towards what matters to you the most so that you can make sure that you're not working above capacity. And finally, we want you to know that your, your life, life matters. matters. As people of color, just remember that the system does not get to determine your worth, your dignity, your, or humanity. Don't forget that you matter. So then it says again, remember your life matters, protect your mind, your heart, and life. And just to go over it really quickly again, Remember as a person of color that there's many di dimensions of you as an ally, your body, your community, your intuition, your goals, your family, your healing, your intentions, your pain, your resiliency, your life. So it's not just the idea that your black life matters. There's so many different components of it. And it's very important for you to recognize each of those components so that you're able to heal. So right now we'll open up for the next four or five minutes for questions. And um, thank you. Thank for you attending. all for so taking open up the, the time questions. to yeah. stay with us. So you could just unmute yourself if you would like to add on to anything that we said or ask a question. Or share our story or your feelings too, if you want to share how, you're, how you feel. I think that it's important at the end of the day to look at all the different dimensions of a person, look at all the different dimensions of a life. When you look at all of the people of color who um, passed away year after year, we forget to look at the different things about them. When Breonna Taylor passed away, people didn't know much about her. And sometimes the only time the media will bring up another part of somebody's life is when they try to mention something negative about their life. It, and that's the sad part. When a person, when a person's life is taken away, people tend to, people want to quickly shine light on the bad things they've done in their life. Instead of remembering that that person is someone's daughter, someone's son. That person is someone's father, someone's mother, someone's, like, you need to think that that person could be your, your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, your son, your daughter. Don't, shine, don't bring to light 
what the bad things they've done in life. Nobody wants to hear that. A person has lost their life. That's the bigger picture. I think Earl was trying to say something. Oh, yeah. It was on a mute. Oh, you can hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you for having this discussion. Um, and I learned new things too, and I'm more open to how, what really is happening. So thank you for taking the time to do this. You're welcome. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. We appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for your comments and all of your support. And we hope that we continue to have this conversation throughout the year. Yes. So we appreciate you all. You will be seeing us sooner rather than later at our yes. mural reveal at 1230. 30, so yes. count on it. Um, so just six minutes from now, we hope you all log in and jump in as we interview the artists and reveal the mural. Thank you all.